In the deepest levels of the ancient burial crypts of Maleth village live the beautiful but deadly succubi. The minions of Skrios all too often seen pass in the Pravak caves as the worshippers of Skrios play their deadly games. But they are not the oldest of the Dubai mid. No, not at all. They found her at twilight, curled in a heap, miles from the ancient castle where she had last been seen headed. It had been months since the massacre in the village of Anak. Ages, it seemed, since the disappearance of the worshippers of the darkest gods. She lay in the forest of the Isle of Man, under the protective branches of the Gylasic tree. Upon returning to the newly dubbed City of Light, under the shiny lampposts they laid her, Her hair, which had always been raven in color, had taken on the bright crimson hues of blood. Her eyes, once the talk of the town had always been a clear crystal blue, but were now dark, nearly black in their steely radiance. The dark gold of her skin had faded, gone ashen in the uninterrupted darkness of that tainted castle. Scars of every size and description ran every possible course over her young body. Strangest, though, was the clothing which covered her. Black satin, it was the courtly dress of a bygone age. She lay tied up in the stately velvet bodice of a lady-in-waiting. Her face was clean, and her hair. Yet she claimed to remember nothing, not even putting on the garb which covered her. Over the mountains of Kesmanium, the sun sank, and the moon began her stately rise into view. As the sky grew dark, shadows grew long and eventually ceased to be seen. The fragments of light, safely encapsulated in their towers of glass, began to glow faintly, and then suddenly they came ablaze with light, illuminating the streets. The kindly priest of recession hopped to their feet and stared with amazement at the girl before them. Her eyes burned with the unholy fire of Dietch. Her young chest heaved with passion. Her hair gleamed violet in the light. Her mouth opened, revealing white pointed teeth. She leaped for the nearest priest and tore at his robe, searching hungrily for the young flesh beneath. He clawed desperately at her to no avail, while the other priest pummeled her with flashing of light and fury, eventually clubbing her with her staves, with not a single scratch upon her body. On a whim, one of the priests, a worshipper of Glioka, hidden behind an empty barrel of ale, threw a heel. Immediately, a possessed woman stood, turning furiously to the point of a dagger-like finger towards him. You, she cried, her voice dark and lusty, her body consumed with shadows. I will find you. I will see to your destruction in my domain. I will find you in your dreams, where no one may hear you scream. With that, she lunged for the youngest priest, who covered his face with his hands desperately. When her strike never came, he lifted his fingers away. She was gone, leaving only the shivering priest to stare in wonder.
She walks slowly, dried leaves crackling beneath her bare feet, like the angry orange flames of a hundred wildfires. The wind whipped angrily around her, the tattered remains of her ancient blue dress swirling about her legs, twisting and binding her until every step was a concentrated effort. Still, though, she never faltered in her progress. Her thin body, racked as it was with desperate shivers, continuing forward as if no obstacle stood too great in her way. Her eyes remained fixed upon the ground, her ice-blue gaze following a path which seemed as if it only barely scratched the fine veneer of sanity. Her mind raced behind all this silence. Her heart leaped, beat more free than she could ever have remembered it before. She strode forward, sure of her destination, more sure than she could ever recall having been. Above her, the trees grew continuously angrier in their ever-increasingly gale, their branches beating one another like angry jabs of punch-drunk brawlers. The clouds blew overhead with unbelievable speed, racing one another towards the open sea on the other side of the Isle of Man. Before her threatened the darkened haze of Castle Dubaimid, perpetual darkness which shades the sheer stone outer walls a deep charcoal gray. As the hour reached midday, imperceptible through the overcast clouds and the never-ending darkness, the haunting bells in the greatest tower struck their haunting tune. The ancient dirge which called the Dubime to their greatest feast. Their inhuman voices raised in praise to their creator, Chattel, and their greatest master. The crawling chaos near Lathotep, not to be forgotten, was Griot's devourer of souls, who nourished them even as they caught not the ashling visitor so rare to enter their castle. On she walked, unaware even as the fat drops of rain began to soak her gown and the noxious sulfurous haze enclosed her, welcoming her fully into the territory of the ancient Castel. All around her, the drums beat in their ancient rhythm, older than the earth sea itself. The drummers sat cross-legged around their instrument, their dark robes covering all but their hands. Some large, some small, some male, some female, some pale, some ruddy, They softly pounded the stretched hide in time to their own heartbeat, each one coming at the same time from the one before it, all perfectly in unison. Around them, in a large circle, stood the remaining worshippers, save one, the high priest who lifted his arms high into the air, crying out the ancient prayers in a loud voice. Almost immediately, one of the worshippers dropped to his knees in the circle, throwing his head back and raising his arms in supplication. His black hair streamed back like a satin cape, catching all aspects of the golden torchlight. He cried out in the old tongue like a thing possessed, and a young woman with hair as fine and smooth as a raven's breast dropped down elsewhere in the circle. Together they cried out their prayers of glory and might in the name of the dark gods, until the electricity in the room was tangible. With a loud crackle like the heavens opening, a clear spark like shattered crystal passed between the high priestess and her congregates. Tangible swirls of darkness form rope-like extensions from the ancient stone floor, twisting and turning and knitting into an inverse tornado, whipping the unconscious woman ebony hair into a tangled mass. 
slowly, so much that it was barely noticeable transition. A mound formed in the center of the whirling dervish, seemingly stretching the ancient stone from its eternal placement until finally it separated into the distinct forms of the Dubai mid. Smaller dog-like pupas clawed their way from the stone, heavily armored gas scrambled out, and two enormous gargoyles lifted themselves from the stone, their huge wings flapping with a vile sound of taut strung flesh. Finally, in a stronger gust of dark ather, Srod, Krieg, and Sal separated themselves from the darkness, forming through their dark gifts the huge and imposing form of a deadly succubus. She stood tall, with her violet hair hanging long down her back, from which two enormous bat-like wings sprung. She stepped forward, her long, perfectly shaped legs swinging easily, her cold gaze passing over, examining everything around her with cold black eyes, so dark that it could not reflect even the brightest light, though they were anything but dull. The horrified worshippers watched, unmoving as the first crackle of lightning the greater power of air was unleashed upon them. The moon rose slowly, the long beams slowly peeking over the low humps of the mountains, crescent-shaped as the uneven patches of earth sheared off the tops and left them in beautiful ruin. Her slow ascent was nearly imperceptible, yet far too quick. While she made her stately entrance, all the earth continued its course, birth and death, life and love. The waves crashed into the shore with a measurable fury, white foam leaping from the waves, deep and dark blue as the skies above. Overhead, the rain-slicked grass parried the turbulent seas, which glittered and danced like a rogue's pocket spilled over with newly varnished stone. Horses fenced in only by the sea set their stilly gaze upon the distant northern skies, where the faint glow of Kadath was visible to those who still saw with eyes as old as the Fae. Sheep, dark and miserable with the rain that soaked through the heavy wool, huddled in mounds beneath the sparse trees, munching on the sodden blades and dark eyes brooding. On the other side of the hill, unable to be seen by the sea, small cottages, the makings of a healthy-sized village, set silent sentry. Warm yellow light spilled out, illuminating the fat raindrops as they passed by, splattering into the puddles already forming in the hard-packed dirt streets. From every chimney rose a wisp of smoke, testament to a warm family tucked inside. Not far away, behind the shelter of mountain, the east woodland stood empty, save for their dark-lined inhabitants of a lone party of Ashling, their swords slicing through wind and rain as easily as they hack through flesh. 
Sal strengthening, Srod peering out into the sudden sloppy deluge. From under the dripping leaves of a pink persinaca, the fae watched, silken wings tucked close to their lithe bodies, tiny ears pricking up from the honey curls of their hair. Quickly they took to the air, whispering past the ashlings who looked up not from their desperate fighting. They flew up in a great cloud to the crest of the hill, the rain not finding them, the light of the moon giving their flesh to a soft luminescent glow. Atop the hill they did alight, finding each a perch among the delicate fragrant flowers of Bethany. Again came the sound, the shrill piercing cry, and another sound, not unlike the blast of distant trumpeters. Far the distance, yet echoing sharply over the sea. Without warning, the horses on the hill began a desperate race for the sight of the hill farthest from the sea, and the fay looked nervously at one another, shifting lightly on their feet. Then they, too, made a dash back to the glades, seeking refuge in the valleys on the other side of the hills hiding deep in the cavernous interiors of the trees. The Ashlings, finished now with their hunt, driven off by the cold and stinging rain, made their way over the hills to the small town on the other side. Stopping for a moment to rest a stitch in her side, a female warrior let her sword touch the ground frowning slightly at the mud which covered her usually gleaming gold armor. Her crimson cape, dark with rain and black blood of the goblins, hung like a lead weight from her shoulders. As she lifted her sword to continue her journey, she took a long, regretful look at the full moon, whose light, had it not been occasionally obscured by the blackened clouds, would have been enough to continue their hunt by. Cerulli, a winged figure passed in front of the darkened shadow of the moon, huge, nearly obscuring it for a moment. From that distance, only a creature of monstrous size could do such a thing. Almost as soon as this permeated the warrior's battle-weary brain, another creature passed, and another, a great fleet of winged horrors. The warrior turned and shouted to her priest, a young man now frowning at his tattered Zeus. The priest looked up and immediately saw the creatures now flying towards them by the hundreds. He shouted desperately and scrambled down the hill to the town, shrieking and waving his Zeus, waking nearly every Ashling in the small town below. Angered by the ruckus, they threw open the doors, frowning, dressed only in their night clothes, feet bare, toes scrunching up at the unwelcome filling of mud. Out of breath, the priest pointed at the unwelcome visitors, now just beginning to crest the final hill and ascend upon the town. The warrior lifted her blade and the two remaining wizards gathered their will for an explosive strike. The first gargoyle landed with a horrific fluttering of wings, red eyes cut like rubies and twice as bright. A gas scrambled from its back and ran towards the warrior, falling at once to her blade, only to be replaced by the next. 
as an entire army of winged gargoyles began to arrive, the gas clinging upon their backs and succubi bringing up the rear, their purple hair wet with rain, their blackened bodies slick. Ashling spilled from the houses, swords uplifted and monkish feet pounding, light wielded as deftly as the tiny roguish daggers and great explosive forces of earth. The Dubaimid fought with all the fury of chattel, and Ashlings with all the passionate fire of Diaj. By morning, half the Ashling population had been failed, but not one had fled, and for each which lay slain, four Dubaimid had joined them. By morning, there was only one question remaining, the one which sang from the Ashling lips like a desperate prayer. Why? The trees reached down their cold, bitter branches, clawing at their cloaks as they wrestled through the forest with their heavy loads. The stinking bodies of the Dubaimid that needed to be disposed of, and the fire for the fallen, had already been lit upon the place of battle. The heavy pupas with their stormy armadillo armor were loaded into carts to be taken off to the Kasmanian mines, where they would be burned in their fiery river which raged below the deepest pits underneath the earth. The gas were quickly turning into mush, shoveled into aged barrels to meet their molten fate. The succubi, too human in their darkness, were burned where they fell, but without the ceremony of the Ashland Ken. Bare patches of black earth remain, even now, at the end place of these dark temptresses. The Legend of the Succubus is a short story written by Cleona. According to the legend, a succubus is a demon that takes on the form of a beautiful woman and seduces men while they sleep. The purpose of the succubus is to drain the life force of the man, leaving him weakened and vulnerable. She is said to have originated in medieval European folklore, where it was believed to be a type of female demon that was sent to seduce men and cause them to sin. The legend of the succubus was often used as a cautionary tale to warn men against the dangers of lust and sexual temptation, possibly originating as an excuse for adultery. Succubi and Incubi appear primarily at night and often tempt men and women to betray their spouses. They are possibly related to the vampire. In some versions of the legend, the succubus is said to be able to shapeshift into various forms, including animals and other monsters. There are dozens of myths and legends surrounding the creature in cultures and religions all over the world. It is believed that the succubus can only target men who are weak or vulnerable, such as those who are sick or depressed. A succubus is a supernatural entity or a demon that manifests itself as a beautiful woman a mythical creature that has been present in various cultures and mythologies throughout history. This mythical creature appears in men's dreams and seduces them into performing sexual acts.
Legends and religious traditions claim that repeated sexual intercourse with a succubus can cause a man to lose his physical and mental health, and in the most extreme cases, even die. Folklore has likened the act of having sexual intercourse with a succubus to entering a cave of ice. In later legends, the succubus also took on the form of sirens, which were beautiful mermaids who lured unsuspecting sailors to shipwreck onto rocky shores. The word succubus first originated in the late 1300s and was derived from the late Latin term succubar, which means to lie beneath. This implies the creature's implied sexual position, in contrast to the man's face-down position. The incubus and succubus are popular characters in folklore and can be traced back several hundred years. When it comes to her actual appearance, the succubus has been described in widely different ways. In many modern representations, the creature may appear in men's dreams, or in the physical world as well. In many works of literature, the succubus has been described as an extremely beautiful, voluptuous, and desirable woman, who often has curled horns, a barbed tail, fangs, bat-like wings, or glowing eyes. However, in older legends, the succubus was not so alluring. Well through medieval times, they were described as grotesque and deformed beings, with many characteristics that demons are thought to possess. Faces like gargoyles, elongated clawed feet, and fingers with ragged claws were all common features believed to have been possessed by the succubus. In some stories, the succubus is depicted as being slightly smaller than the average woman, who either stopped or crawled on the ground instead of upright and walking. In mythology and folklore, succubi are often portrayed as seductive, alluring creatures who possess a range of strengths and weaknesses. Strengths, seduction, Succubi have the ability to seduce and manipulate their victims, often using their beauty and allure to entice them into dangerous situations. Shapeshifting. Succubi are often depicted as being able to change their form, allowing them to take on the appearance of a variety of creatures and objects. Immortality. Succubi are often portrayed as being immortal or having a long lifespan, which gives them a significant advantage over mortal beings. Weaknesses. Vulnerability to banishment. In many legends, succubi can be banished or exorcised from an area or person through the use of certain rituals and spells. Weakness to holy symbols and objects. Some legends suggest that the succubi are weakened or repelled by holy symbols or objects, such as crosses, holy water, or prayer. Limited power over strong-willed individuals. While succubi have the ability to seduce and manipulate weaker individuals, they might struggle to control those strong-willed or unwavering moral convictions. The strengths and weaknesses may vary depending on the specific legend or myth being referenced. The powers of the entity are death by sex, dreamwalking, oneric slaying, sleep inducement, enhanced condition or supernatural condition, enhanced dexterity or supernatural dexterity, 
enslavement kiss, invisibility, kiss of death, life force absorption, malleable anatomy, shape-shifting, mental inducement, manipulation, desire, inducement, Succubi are mythical creatures. Their abilities and limitations are not based in reality, and they should not be understood as fictional constructs rather than factual information. It is often used as a cautionary tale, warning individuals of the dangers of giving in to their desires and temptation. The succubus has been a symbol of temptation, lust, and evil in many cultures and mythologies. The signs of being attacked by a succubus would not be a pleasant experience as you might think. These are demons, they seek to feed, and they make your life a living hell. Although daytime wouldn't be extremely different, the noticeable difference would be around when you sleep. A possession in the case of a succubus isn't like the classic possession, as they just tap into you and kind of twist your mind. You are still you, but some of your feelings aren't really your own. A succubus doesn't only feed off your sexual energy, although it does mainly. It can still feed off of other energies. As with other demons, they can still and will get stronger with negative energy. The sexual experience may affect your body, but if you are truly possessed by one, it will feed off your soul energy. So any sexual experience will happen within your soul, not your body, and any pleasure that you might feel will be brief. And you will most likely wake as soon as it's over, as they don't care about making you feel pleasure as soon as they have fed off your energy. It is a demon after all. Everything it does is about it and nothing but. So if it is possessing someone, the person would most likely be tired most of the time, feeling drained, sluggish, antisocial, or not going out of their way to talk to anyone, mood swings, and very restless nights. So overall, it would be a very terrible experience, and unless something was done about it, it would continue to feed off of them. Perhaps without them even knowing about it, and continue to make their health get worse over time, especially mentally. Host, the person who is under entity attack will likely experience the following symptoms. Lower back pain, dirty bathroom, crowded dirty bedroom, closet or bed, substance abuse, controlling jealousy, Controlling insecurity, sexual dreams, disrespect for a partner, lack of arousal for a partner, desire for porn, love triangles, anxiety, narcissistic attitude and behaviors, lack of self-awareness, and mad self-appeal. While the exact origin of the myth of a succubus is not known, the first actual mention of the term succubus came in the late 14th century, though the myth has a few different versions. One version claims that a succubus is a female demon, which impregnates itself by seducing a human male, while its male counterpart, the incubus, impregnates human women. Other versions claim that the succubus and incubus are a single shapeshifter that can assume both male and female forms. The demon first collects human semen as a succubus, and then transforms into an incubus and impregnates a woman. Sometimes these demons would possess their victims, through sexual intercourse while the person is sleeping.
Judeo-Christianity folklore tells a tale of a woman named Lilith, who later turned into a succubus. Lilith was believed to be Adam's first wife, who was created during the same time as him, before Eve. She later left Adam, and there is plenty of conjecture to why she did it. However, one of the most famous accounts involves her meeting with the Archangel Samuel and refusing to return to Eden. She then transformed into a succubus, and her children engendered from demons, known as Lowlands, were sent out into the world as demons where they became lesser succubi. However, some writers believe that the succubus was not necessarily evil. In fact, a succubus named Meridiana was allegedly involved with Pope Sylvester II and helped him achieve his high status. Before his death, Sylvester supposedly confessed to his sins. Throughout history, Religious clerics from both Christianity and Judaism have been fighting to curb the powers of the succubus over humans. The most comprehensive treatise on witchcraft, Malleus Maleficarum, laid out ways to deal with succubi, the best of which included confession and exorcism. Lilith has emerged in Sumerian, Roman, Greek, and Egyptian legends as well, and is regarded as the mother of all succubi. In Sumer, Lilith was first worshipped as a goddess of fertility, agriculture, and witchcraft. Later in Babylonian and Assyria, she was associated with night demons that stole babies and ate them. In Greek mythology, Lilith was known as Lamia, who was given an extensive backstory. In the legend, she was once a beautiful woman who was transformed into a hideous monster by the goddess Hera, who became jealous of her beauty. After she turned into a monster, Lilith wandered the world, seducing men and eating children. Other references to Lamia claim she was the mother to Zeus's two children. When Hera found out about her husband's deception, instead of punishing Zeus, she cursed Lamia into a snake-like monster similar to Medusa. Hera then had Lamia's children killed, and then cursed her to walk the earth looking for her lost children and eating the children of others. In other myths, Zeus hid Lamia in a cave and gave her permission to kill any person who dared to enter her territory. Lamia also appeared in Old English legends and was called the Lamia. This creature appeared in the form of a beautiful woman in graveyards and would lure young men to their deaths by posing as a helpless woman. The legend claims that if you see a woman in need of help in graveyards, you should call out to her. Elamia cannot answer you back in a human voice, as she has a serpentine tongue and can only hiss. In the Middle Ages, the succubus appeared in the night to seduce men into sexual encounters. This lore was especially exploited by celibate monks who claimed they were often attacked by the creature and blame the succubus for their lascivious thoughts and dreams. Later, women who tried to seduce men 
were accused of being succubi in disguise, while those who became pregnant out of wedlock were charged with having sexual interactions with the incubi. After the advent of the Renaissance, the succubus declined in popularity as artists turned their focus towards the beautiful and unfairly cursed Lamia from Greek mythology. It wasn't until the late 18th century when Gothic literature gained prominence that the succubus made a comeback. However, by that time they had experienced a dramatic transformation, turning from the hideous demonic creatures into beautiful and cunning beings. Smart, sexy, and potentially deadly, the succubus is not a demon to be underestimated. She is a powerful seductress who loves nothing more than to toy with men. And although she might seem fun at first, you wouldn't want to make her angry. In conclusion, the succubus is a mythical creature. There is no real world danger from encountering one. But let's be real here. There are entity attachments that do feed on human energy. And these entities can ruin your life by destroying your relationships, your self-confidence, and your sanity. Despite being a popular legend, there is no scientific evidence to support the existence of succubi. The legend of the succubus is a popular mythological tale that has been passed down for centuries. However, the legend continues to be a popular topic in literature, film, and other forms of media. They are often symbols of temptation and the dangers of giving in to one's desires. There are some strategies that can be helpful in resisting temptation in general. Be aware of your vulnerabilities and recognize situations or circumstances that might make you more susceptible to temptation and avoid them whenever possible. Set boundaries. Establish clear boundaries for yourself in terms of what you will and will not tolerate and stick to them. Practice self-control and develop good habits of self-control such as meditation, exercise, and other healthy activities that can help you resist temptation. Seek support and surround yourself with friends and family who are supportive of your goals and values and who can provide encouragement and accountability when needed. Focus on positive relationships. Build positive relationships with others that are based on mutual respect and shared values. Seek professional help if needed, and if you are struggling with addiction or other issues that make it difficult to resist temptation, Seek professional help from a therapist or counselor. Remember, the succubus is a fictional creature, and while the dangers of temptation are real, they can be overcome with the right strategies and support. Often portrayed as a seductive female demon, the succubus represents temptation, lust, and the dangers of giving in to one's desires. While the succubus is a fictional construct, the themes it represents, such as the importance of resisting temptation and staying true to one's values, are prevalent to many aspects of life. Through stories and legends, the succubus has served as a cautionary tale, warning individuals of the dangers of succumbing to temptation. Whether through literature, art, or other forms of media, the succubus remains a popular and enduring symbol of temptation and the dangers of giving in to one's desires. Succubi still have a place in fantasy and science fiction. They have appeared in the works of Stephen King, Orson Scott Card, Jonathan Stroud, and Stephanie Meyer.
Not surprisingly, the succubus shows up even more in visual genres, like comic books and video games, where her hot body and strappy leather costume can attract lots of attention. From a psychological, political perspective, the legend of the succubus is fairly straightforward. In a patriarchal world, men were intimidated by women who took control of their own lives and their own sexuality, so they demonized any type of rebellious behavior. There might also be a biological explanation. 60% of the total human population suffers from sleep paralysis, a sporadic condition that causes the brain to regain consciousness before the body does. During an episode of sleep paralysis, people suffer from hallucinations involving all five senses and an extreme sense of terror. These symptoms could easily be mistaken for a demonic visitation. Today, the word succubus conjures up voluptuous images of women with long, wavy hair and silky skin and flawless curves. They wear skimpy leather costumes to flaunt their bodies, and they don't even try to hide their telltale signs of their demonic nature. These entities can ruin your life by destroying your relationship, your self-confidence, your sanity. Ultimately, a good ending to your experience, if you might have one, is to share your story to support others who might be struggling in the same manner. Get a healing and live positively. It's your experience, your story to tell. You choose how it ends. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching. And if you liked it, please share it out. Please leave a comment after you watch it. I love my comments. And I hope to see you guys at the next episode. Thank you guys.